Well, friends, if you would turn with me, please. We are this morning back in our study of First and Second Thessalonians. Today we're in First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start reading here in just a minute in chapter 4, verse 1. As we open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, something happens here inside of this book that actually happens in the vast majority of Paul's letters. Uh, Oftentimes, the first major section in Paul's letter is going to have to do with doctrine and what we believe and some correction of of these doctrinal issues. And then he moves into the second section of the letter into how should we now live because we believe these things are true. And that's the turn that we take now in 1 Thessalonians. Up to this point, the Apostle Paul has spent a lot of his time and effort defending his ministry among the Thessalonians. I know that our enemies and opponents have come to the church and they've contested who we are and what we do. We need to remind you of who we were. He's defended the gospel of God itself. You remember the kind of power that came when we preached to you. It wasn't our power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that changed your lives. He defended the gathering of the body of Christ. Remember, it's so important for me to actually get back and physically be with you, the importance of the church itself. Now what Paul does is he begins to dig into how we ought to live. In one sense, a lot of what we're going to deal with inside of this chapter has to do with our Christian ethic. Not just what we believe about God and His gospel and the church, but how we live. And he moves from how we live to the topic of the coming of the Lord. This is going to become important to Paul by the time that this book is done. Jesus Christ is coming back again. He just is. And since that is the case, how then should we live as followers of Jesus Christ between now and then? Paul told them, you may recall, right at the end of chapter 3, as he prays for them, he prays that God would make them a holy people. In chapter 3, verse 13, he says, or he prays, so that he, God, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So here now he prays for their holiness and now he addresses what that holiness looks like. In fact, what is maybe at the very core of our passage of Scripture this morning is in chapter 4, verse 3, where he says this, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is the process. When he speaks of sanctification, this is the process of growth as a follower of Jesus Christ, that I'm becoming more and more like him all the time, growing in holiness. So in the passage that we're going to read this morning, we're going to get partway through chapter 4 today. Here are some of the things that we're going to deal with. First of all, disciples of Jesus Christ should live to please God. He uses that language rather straightforwardly in this passage of Scripture. In this requirement that followers of Jesus Christ live to please God, I think goes deeper into our souls than maybe we initially think. In fact, I believe it goes right to the very core of our discipleship. So disciples of Jesus Christ should live to please God. And then he goes on to what does it actually mean for that to happen? What does it mean for the Thessalonian Christians, for uh, the Colorado Springs Christians to please God with their way of life? And as he walks into that conversation in chapter 4, he essentially hits three, maybe four big ideas in this chapter. First of all, he tells them that they need to learn and live a godly understanding of human sexuality. Pastor Phil, do we really have to talk about this morning? Yes, we do. The Apostle Paul finds it's radically important that there's a certain kind of witness to our human sexuality that belongs to God and not to this world. So he speaks to that issue. And then he speaks to the issue of our need to learn to love each other with a brotherly love and our need to learn how to work well as followers of Jesus Christ. Literally what we do with our hands to earn a paycheck and take care of other people. How we work well as followers of Jesus Christ. And then Paul, as this chapter ends, in fact it's a passage that if you've been to a funeral recently of, uh, of a deceased follower of Jesus Christ, you've probably heard this passage of Scripture read. 
that when people die in the faith, we grieve, but we don't grieve as people who have no hope. And so Paul has to then deal with what it means for us to be people of hope even in our loss as we follow Jesus Christ. There's a lot of really important things to deal with in this passage of Scripture about how we live to please God. So let's begin reading. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, he says this, Finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to live and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. We ask and we urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us, when you listen to us about how now to live as followers of Jesus Christ, we do so to please God. And I'm glad to hear that a lot of that is happening and I want us to do it more and more. Paul had received word from Timothy uh, about the church and where they were, how they were doing well and where they were struggling, where Paul needed to write to talk to them about this, this, and this, and even encourage them or correct them inside of their faith. You see, their salvation is not just a matter of getting saved and then waiting for death or the coming of Jesus Christ, right? I get saved and now I'm okay until either I die or Jesus comes again and finally I'm in eternity. Salvation means a change in life here and now. And for the Thessalonians, it was critical for Paul that they continue to walk in their salvation. All of these people, the Thessalonians, the Colossians, the Ephesians, the Philippians, they're all brand new Christians and they have a brand new way of life. I think it's always important for us to remind ourselves from time to time that there is no second generation Christian in the New Testament. Every single one of them is a young convert or an adult convert. They weren't raised in a Christian home with a set of expectations. They were raised in a completely different lifestyle and culture. And now that they become followers of Jesus Christ, they're learning something brand new in Jesus. So Paul says, the things that we taught you about how to live, the way that we showed you how to live with our own lives, I'm glad that you're walking down that path, but let's keep walking even further. You see, the very structures of the Christian's social setting are changing. The very structures of how they do life their family relationships are changing. Their sexual behaviors are changing as followers of Jesus Christ. Their understanding of work and love is changing. Their understanding of death itself is changing because they're followers of Jesus Christ. The world that these early Christians lived in it's probably more different than we may typically imagine when we sort of maybe read a passage like this and we sort of place ourselves inside of this passage and kind of wonder what this means. But when we think about what happens in their lives because of their salvation, it may actually be a little bit more radical than we normally imagine. So their salvation means change. It means change in daily habits, change in what they do and change in their hearts and minds emotions, creativity, thoughts, and intentions. So Paul says this, I'm so glad to hear that you continue to walk in this path that we showed you, how you ought to live and to please God. How you ought to live and to please God. When Paul now talks to Christians about living to please God, here's what's going on. Paul is now giving us a standard for what makes something moral or immoral. He is now giving, giving us a standard for what makes a behavior right or wrong, an intention right or wrong, a consequence moral or immoral, an individual moral or immoral. Our standard now is to live so that we please God. I've been teaching ethics on the college level for a long time now which means I have really cool stories about students and I have really frightening stories about students and how they understand ethics. 
We deal with ethical systems and what this person's taught or what this school of thinking has taught. We think about current issues and what it means to think ethically about this or that kind of issue. But in every class, one of the most important things that we put across is how to answer this question. What makes something moral? What's the standard? In fact, I will sometimes just use the phrase, what is our morality maker? And Paul says to the Thessalonians and to you and me, we are now living so as to please God. This has become our standard, the maker of our morality, how we live to please and honor God. The disciple of Jesus Christ, as Paul has laid it out to them so far as he's talked about it, as he'll continue to deal with it in this passage, the disciple has been given a brand new life through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the gift of the Holy Spirit he's going to mention later on. And so now our lives are on this path. They're intended to be on this path where now as we live, we want to please God. And it's not just this kind of moment where Paul just says this and Pastor Phil decides to land on it for way too long. It's not just this moment, right? He says this several times. Romans chapter 8, he puts it like this in verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. In this passage of Scripture, he's dealing with the difference of the life that is set on the spirit and the life in the mind that is set on the flesh. So the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But what he goes on to say is that, but you, follower of Jesus Christ, have been given the spirit which gives you life. And so now a brand new door is open to you so that you and I can live so as to please God. Jesus Christ, our example and our power for this kind of life, he says this to his brand new disciples in John chapter six. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In fact, the gospel of John is filled with this kind of language. Jesus, God in flesh, it's a shocking thing for us to read sometimes. I haven't come here to do what I want to do. I've come here to fulfill the will of my Father to glorify him and not myself. In fact, this is part of what he says in John chapter eight, verse 50. Yet I do not seek my own glory. Now there is one who's going to seek my glory and it is my father, but I'm here to seek his. So as we listen to what Paul says, as we listen to what Jesus says about how you and I should be living life, we're taking cues. We're learning now what makes this life the kind of thing that pleases God. So pleasing God, this kind of standard gets right at the very core of our discipleship. A pastor and theologian by the name of John Stott, who passed away just recently, as he was writing on this passage of Scripture, he says this about the standard of pleasing God. It strikes at the roots of our discipleship and challenges the reality of our profession. How can we claim to know and to love God if we do not seek to please Him? Disobedience is ruled out. When I read that, that's convicting for you. No, when I read that, it's convicting to me. When I, I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to have this kind of perspective. I've got to be able to think this way. To love God is to want to seek to please Him with my life. Disobedience is ruled out because I know that actually hurts the heart of God. It dishonors God in my life. It does harm to my relationship with Him, and it does harm with my relationship with you when sin is at work inside of my life. So instead, I want to learn how to please God. This kind of standard is magnificent because it's a standard that has to do with what's going on inside of the intentions of my heart and my mind. It's what I want to do. It's my will. It's my desire. It's not just a set of legalistic standards. The Pharisees were very good at lists of do's and don'ts. But what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? All right, your lips are close to me, but your heart has nothing to do with me. Your hearts are far away from me. If we walk down this path of pleasing God, our lips will be close to God and our hearts will be close to God as well. 
drawing nearer and nearer to him, pleasing him. Imagine a story, if you will, of a group of boys throwing rocks at a building to break windows. I know most boys don't do that, but sometimes boys do that. Boys throwing rocks at a building in order to throw windows. And there's one boy there who's not picking up rocks, and he's not throwing rocks, and, and the boy next to him says, why aren't you throwing your rocks? Are you afraid of what your father's going to do if he hears this and you get in trouble? And the boy's response is, is I'm not afraid of what my father's going to do to me. I'm afraid of what this will do to my father. You see the difference there? I'm going to act out of love for my father, not fear of my father. What I want to do is not avoid his punishment or his gaze. I want to act so that I can please him and so that that relationship is close and it's tight and it's good and it's right between me and my heavenly Father. So the disciple of Jesus Christ is learning how to please God with their lives instead of <laughs> learning how to please every other false idol or ideology that you and I normally live to please. The kinds of standards that the world sets up about what the good life looks like but that always interfere with what God wants to do in the lives of his disciples, but that always interfere with the will of God inside of our homes, our families, our marriages, our friendships, our work, our labor, the works of our souls themselves. We decide maybe we want to please those kinds of worldly standards instead of God, and those things always distract from the work of God inside of our lives. And typically, we want to please those things instead. The disciple is learning how to please God with their lives instead of what is maybe the largest, brightest, shiniest idol that sits inside of Phil's heart, me. (laughs) Learning to please God instead of myself. Happiness is not found in self-absorption. Happiness is not found in selfishness. And in fact, a lifestyle of selfishness is a great way to hinder the work of God inside of my life and to alienate almost everyone else around me. There's this incredible little glimpse into this little detail In 3 John, as John the disciple writes to this church, he's writing about how he wants to come and see them, and he writes about this person and this person. I want you to say this and do this. In 3 John, verses 9 and 10, he gets to this. I have written something to the the church, but Diotrephanes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing. talking talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. How does all of that junk happen? Because there's someone who wants to put himself first. And so the apostle says, when I show up, we're going to deal with this. I see all of the dysfunction, all of the brokenness, all of the division that happens in the body of Christ and inside of the family of God because we've got someone like this who likes to put themselves first. Who I want to please with my life is just going to change my internal standards. What I want to do, what I think is important, how I want to talk, how I want to live, how I want to structure my priorities. Remember, we put it like this a week or two ago. The ones that I serve are the ones that, or excuse me, the ones that I want to please are the ones that I serve. The people that I want to please, the things that I want to please, those become the things and the people that I serve with my life. So notice this as well about a life that is aimed at pleasing God. I will be best for others when I teach myself how to please God with my life. I will be best for you 
If I am on a path of learning how to please God, we will be best for our spouses, our kids, our parents, our friends, our work, if we are on a path to pleasing God with our lives. Here's part of the evidence of the power of that. The opposite is not true. If I'm on a pathway of learning how to please other people, I will not be best for God, (laughs) and I will not be best for everybody else either. But if I'm walking this path that God is giving us, and He's giving us actually specific details as we make make our way through the rest of chapter 4 and His other epistles, but if I'm on that path to pleasing God with my life, the kind of path that I am on is the path toward the fruit of the Spirit. Who doesn't want or need more of the fruit of the Spirit at work inside of our lives? The love and the joy and the peace and the patience and on it goes. That's the path that we're on. If we're on the path of pleasing God, we're also on the path of learning what sacrificial love toward each other actually looks like. We're on a path toward peace that endures through trials. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you know that expressing sacrificial love also means we need peace through trial? (laughs) Okay, that's just an inside joke. And the path of pleasing God inside of my life is a path of justice toward one another. You want justice in this world? I'm I'm gonna give you a little clue as to how this does and does not work. You and I will not be able to elect anybody who establishes justice in this world. The follower of Jesus Christ is going to start to establish justice inside of their circles of life and relationship. You want justice in this world? Start on a path of pleasing God with your life, your behaviors, the way you treat other people, the way you handle your finances, the way you handle your family. This is the path of justice in this world. So Paul says, so this is the will of God. This is what God wants, your sanctification. Sanctification is this 50-cent word that we use in Christian circles that shows up from time to time inside of Scripture, but it is a word that we use that describes the process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ inside of my life. Not just what I think and feel, but how I live with others as well. Sanctification is the process of becoming less consumed and run by my own sin and more consumed with Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the work of Christ in me. It is an open door to a brand new way of life. I like using that phrase because the process of sanctification means I put myself in the way of God so that God can have his way in me. I spend time in God's word and in prayer and with God's family and in silence and solitude and all of these things that God has given us so that we're in his way, we're in his presence so that he can have his way with us. This is the process of sanctification. Sanctification is a bumpy road. It's not a linear line from today until glory. (laughs) I'm going to get better and better and better and better every day of my life. Because everything that happens to us in life, every stumble, every valley, every mountaintop, every desert experience can be seen through the lens of what is Christ doing in me. What is Christ doing in us? So every step in life can become a part of our growth in Jesus Christ. But as Paul puts it here, it is the will of God that we look more and more like Jesus Christ all the time. And he's so thankful that he hears good things about that happening with this church. But he wasn't satisfied with that. He says, I want to hear more and more and more because there's just so much more to do. So if he says it's God's will that you and I look like and live like and sound like Jesus Christ more and more, here are some hardcore specifics for you, some things for us to actually do as our lives change. So 
He begins with, in verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And he begins with this in part because it's the world that they live in, but he also begins with it because this is simply a part of how God has built us. And how this expresses itself in our lives can make or break us and those around us. So let's read what he has to say. That you abstain from sexual immorality, verse 4. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Here's what Paul wants from these brand new Christians as he deals with this topic. First of all, that they would stop living in the sexual lifestyle and ethics of the Greek and Roman world around them that they came out of. It's immoral, it's destructive, it's against the will of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he also says that he wants them to learn self-control. And in learning self-control, they're going to honor God and learn how to please God with their lives. But then did you also notice this? They would honor their neighbor because without it, you actually transgress your brothers and sisters. You dishonor them, you sin against them. You do damage when you don't exercise the kind of self-control that we're talking about. And then as he finishes that little section, he wants us to learn to live the kind of life that's been given to us through the Holy Spirit. God's given you this life. No individual human being has given you this life. God has given it to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's learn to live into it. And when he talks like this to the Thessalonians, it's a far more, I think, radical break from what was normal than we might imagine as we just kind of pass through a passage of Scripture like this. But not only is it far more of a break than maybe we would normally imagine, it turns out that it builds a far better world than we would have had if it weren't for Christians who were faithful to Jesus Christ in this matter. So let's talk about this for a moment or two. Abstain from sexual immorality. The word that Paul uses here, and it's actually used throughout the New Testament, is porneia or porneos. And that word stands for, throughout the New Testament, all kinds of forms of sexual immorality, but primarily referring generally to fornication and adultery. As we walk through passages of Scripture like this and what Paul wants the church to live like, what the New Testament teaches us, the way C.S. Lewis puts it, it is about as straightforward as it possibly can be. It says, the Christian ethic on human sexuality is chastity or marriage. C.S. Lewis says that's hard, but there it is, chastity or marriage. And we, I think, can add heterosexual marriage is the Christian ethic as well. But as Paul talks about sexual immorality and what he also calls in verse 5, the passion of their lust of those Gentiles who do not know God, we need to understand that this was just a part of their world. It was normal to them. Their lifestyle was completely different. And in order to understand how different it was, let's do a little bit of comparison, uh, comparing and contrasting between a couple of different points of view. In our culture, when we begin to think about the values and morality that surround marriage and sexuality and family, we have a set of assumptions about how these things really should work. Now, as I read through the, uh, just a short list of assumptions about how these things kind of work, most of us in the room, this room are going to think, yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> That's not what actually happens. That's not normal. But when you think that, what's going on? Something in the back of your mind is saying, what's normal? And I want this to be the case. This should be the case. I wish this had been the case. I want it to be the case in the future. But we've been handed a set of assumptions 
that's built into us, even as much as, you know, we in our culture fail at this, we assume a lot of these things. We assume that inside of the bond of marriage, it's a commitment. We assume that it's a, it's a covenant. We use the language of covenant when we talk about the joining of husband and wife. We assume that the marriage covenant is a certain kind of moral connection. It's not just a legal connection. It's not just a piece of paper that we sign, but there's something divine about it. There's something moral about it. I'm ethically bonded to this commitment that we have made. And so things like the act of adultery is a breach of that covenant and has to be put back together again. Kids need parents. Even as that falls apart, we know that we want this to be true and we assume these things to be what it means to be healthy in a marriage and family relationship. Here's the kicker. The Thessalonian Christians did not inherit that world. Their world had none of those assumptions built into it. Every one of those assumptions has been built into my culture and your culture by the Judeo-Christian tradition with Christians using Scripture as their guide for what marriage and family and human sexuality ought to look like. We have inherited the changed lives of the Thessalonians. Does that make sense? So when we talk about what marriage and sexuality was like in their culture, what we're learning is how much our early Christian brothers and sisters changed things and how much it rests on us to change things again, right? Amen? Marriage and sexuality inside of their culture. Just a few details. You can read this throughout uh, Roman and Greek philosophers and politicians, um, uh, political scientists, names that you would know. They assume that this is what life is like inside of their world. First of all, young adult men are simply paired with teenage girls for the sake of family inheritance. They're just paired up because the family needs an inheritor to, to take over the business that's part of the guild. If they own land, to take over the land. If they have a flock, to take over the flock. Young adult men paired with teenage girls, that's just how families would be put together by and large. Men inside of the Thessalonian world, the Greek and Roman world that Paul had, men had only one cultural or even only one legal restriction to their sexual behavior. And that was they could not have sex with married women who were above their social class. Everyone else was fair game and was expected, male, female, young, old. That was the only restriction the men in their world had on sexual behavior. Marriage and sexuality inside of their world did not have a moral connection inside of it. It was a connection of practicality. It was a legal connection. It was a hedonistic connection. Marriage and sexuality did not have what we would call love connected to it at all either. So the Christian church, disruptors like the Apostle Paul and these young Christians in Thessalonica, they come along and they connect using Scripture as their guide, they connect human sexuality to marriage. In fact, they limit human sexuality to marriage. They connect marriage to family and all of it to God. Now, if you were a slave or a servant in the household of a wealthy and powerful Thessalonian, Macedonian man, and he and his family become Christians, Can you just imagine for a second how much your life has just changed because of this kind of thing that Paul has to say? It turns out, friends, that without God inside of this equation, women and children in their world, and especially everyone of lower social classes, were exposed to abuse and abandonment and exploitation. It was normal in their world and expected. When the Christian church says that the moral person is the one who is able to exercise self-control inside of marriage, it ends up building a safe context for everybody. Does that make sense? It creates safety and flourishing for everybody involved. 
women and children and the poor and the, those who are just not socially powerful, they are protected. One of the great lies that is being foisted in our culture today is that sexual liberty is freedom. Sexual liberty is destruction. It's oppression. That's what it is. A value of sexual liberty always favors the wealthy and the powerful. It's just the way that it is. And along comes the Christian church, and it changes everything. So what Paul is giving us here is not just sort of a half-embarrassing set of lists of, I just don't want you to do that kind of stuff. It's everything's changing. And because you're followers of Jesus Christ, now this part of your life, you're gonna do, it, you're gonna do things differently. You're gonna interact with your family differently. You're gonna act with other people differently. And we actually inherit that world because they do it. This matter of self-control in verse four, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. <laughs> That's beautiful, that no one transgress. Self-control is a quality of maturity that protects my neighbor. I need to say that one more time. Self-control is a quality of my maturity in Jesus Christ that protects my neighbor. Paul says, here's how I want you to live so that you don't sin against your neighbor. Self-control is a big deal in the New Testament. At one point, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, for God, for God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and of love and of self-control. Okay, that's a beautiful passage of Scripture. The spirit that God gave you, Christian, is not a spirit of fear, but it's one of power. And in preaching circles, when we hear stuff like that, pastors say weird things to each other sometimes. God gave you a spirit of power, and we like to say, oh, that'll preach. <laughs> God gave you a spirit of love. Oh, man, that's gonna preach. God gave us a spirit of self-control. Nobody wants to hear that sermon, right? This is what God has given us because it's important and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's for our flourishing. Our community needs Christians who live up to this ethic so that we can please God. Self-control is this virtue, the work of the Holy Spirit that helps us overcome the power of sin and actually leads us into healthy relationships with each other. And as Paul puts it right at the very end of this little section, neglecting this new kind of life is actually neglecting the gift of the Spirit of God himself. For whoever disregards this, disregards not what I taught you, not what I have given you, but what God has given you, who gives you, who graces you, his Holy Spirit. So living in the power of the Spirit of God means that we're actually learning how to relate to each other differently. The Thessalonian Christians are learning a brand new way of life, and you and I so often are relearning a brand new way of life, being drawn back to our morality maker, being drawn back to our north star, what it means to live to please God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's, Paul finds these details important. He doesn't just say, I want you to please God, and on we go. I want you to live to please God, and here's what this means now. And one piece in this chapter builds upon the next. So instead of this way of life that they were used to, that the culture without God is so accustomed to, where there's this broken and this oppression and this difficulty and this pain that's brought into people's lives because of the misuse of human sexuality, he says instead of that, there's a whole brand new way of living that's been given to you in Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 9, and I want us to touch on this passage, and we'll probably come back to it next week as well as we continue to go through the steps of what Paul says in chapter 4. But in verse 9, he says this. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly 
and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So Paul continues to walk through what this life of pleasing God actually looks like. Now concerning brotherly love. We've taught you some things, and you may not need a lot more, but I want you to know more and more about God's kind of love. This is what Paul is saying in this passage. Brotherly love is, in the Greek, literally the word Philadelphia, the love of friendship, the love between two people, brotherly love. And then he later on uses that word agape, and that's the That's the word that Christians love to talk about when we talk about the love of God. That's sacrificial love, God's kind of love, agape kind of love. But the Apostle Paul says, I don't want you to forget what brotherly love means, the love of friendship. What a gift God gives every one of us when God grants us the love of friendship over time. It is a powerful and beautiful thing. I think our culture struggles with the love of friendship because of this one little detail that Paul's trying to correct earlier on in this chapter. In a culture that overly sexualizes every human being at every age, the love that suffers is the love of friendship. Paul says, I don't want you to forget this kind of love. A genuine desire for the good of another of a brother or sister in Jesus Christ. Paul and the rest of the New Testament do something really cool with this word for brotherly love. Inside of Paul's world, it literally stands for brotherly love. So the kind of love that exists inside of a blood-related family, that's what we're going to refer to as Philadelphia, as brotherly love. What Paul does is he says, you're a family. And so we're going to take this idea and we're going to extend it to the family of God. And so now what was, what used to belong just to a smaller group of people now belongs to all of us as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Because what we have in common is Christ. It's not blood relation, but what we have in common is the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul was thankful that they were doing that and that they should do it more and more. And And then he throws this in, and as you're reading it through, it almost feels like he he wants to make sure he squeezes this in before he gets on to the other important stuff. But as Paul begins to talk about living a certain kind of quiet life and working well, Paul's going to come back to this two or three more times before he is done with the Thessalonians. I want you to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Paul is addressing a very specific problem among the Thessalonian Christians because some of them expected the coming of Jesus Christ so quickly, they decided I shouldn't waste my time working. So I'm going to stop my work And a little bit later on in the book, Paul's just going to call them sloths. They're lazy. They've quit working. Because Jesus is coming, I'm going to stop working. I'm going to actually become a drain on everyone around me. And Paul says, that's not how this works. We work with our hands. We work well so that we don't become a drain on others, but we become the kind of people who through our work can give to others as well. You see, by doing what they were doing, ceasing in their work and becoming busybodies, as he puts it, they were failing to love each other with a brotherly love, failing to take care of themselves, failing to use the resources that they gain to take care of each other, and as he says, failing in their witness to the rest of the city. And so show yourselves well before everybody else. So guys, their work, our work, can be both love and witness in this world. And two quick thoughts on this. First of all, work well done accomplishes brotherly love. We take our hands, whatever energy and talent and opportunity God has given, it, given us, and we give it to each other. This is part of how work accomplishes brotherly love. You do what I need done but can't do, and vice versa. Especially if you're a barista in a good coffee shop. 
I really need you to do your job. In fact, I need you to be really good at your job, right? We take what God has given us and we give it to each other when we work. Those who work supply for family and friends, for the family of God, for employees. They supply for their neighbor. God has given us work so that we can do for others as well. So work accomplishes brotherly love, but work also bears witness to God's gifts in this world. What has God given you to give back to this world? And when you do that, you're displaying the gifts of God at work inside of this world. And it's just another way of saying, what do we do with our daily lives to please God with our work? This has become now our guide. This now has become the thing that moves us and drives us in everything that we do, how we relate to each other inside and outside of our families, how we relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and even with what we're going to do when we wake up tomorrow morning and we go back to that job. We're aiming at pleasing God, and it turns out to be love for each other in witness to the glory of God Himself. Let's pray.